Hello folks, it's me, Demontropolis, and I return to the Mega Man NES Hexology with Mega Man 5, released in 1992. At this point, we're getting pretty late into the NES's life cycle, and the Super NES has been taking off at this point. However, as Capcom was still doing their Robot Master contests yearly, they were fine staying on the NES to make Mega Man games. With Mega Man 5, the developers felt like they accomplished all the major gameplay features with Mega Man 4. So with this new entry, the focus was simply upgrading existing features, such as the Charge Buster and Rush Coil. There was also a new project leader on board for this game, so in an effort to have everyone on the same page, the developers aimed to give this game a lower difficulty level. These are the traits Mega Man 5 is known for, but have they helped the game stand out from its brothers? Well, let's find out and get started. Mega Man 5 To start, one of the greatest things about Mega Man 5 is that it perfects the controls of the NES era. Slide is perfect, movement is slick and snappy, and the Charge Buster actually has a buffer that allows you to charge it during transitions. It's the best controlling game of this era of classic Mega Man. For the story, Mega Man 5 gives us a quick opening with a nice transition to the title screen. We immediately know what the conflict is, with eight new Robot Masters on the block, but there's also the mystery of who's leading this army. The only clue Mega Man gets is the scarf falling into his hand, and the music complements the whole sequence very well with its transition into the title theme. When it comes to this whole plot of Proto Man's betrayal, I honestly think this is a weak thread in convincing you that Proto Man is actually evil. This is because in the previous game, Mega Man 4, the only thing Proto Man did was save Kalinka and that helped prove Dr. Cossack's innocence, a morally good action that contrasts so heavily with Proto Man having a castle in his image for all to see. It would have been more believable if this plot came right after Mega Man 3 instead, since Proto Man is still pretty grey with fighting Mega Man and helping him at the same time. I imagine Dr. Wily wanted to get back at Proto Man for what he did in the fourth game as kidnapping Dr. Light makes sense if an evil Proto Man wanted to get something out of him, but I still think it could have been delivered better. Proto Man himself is barely involved in this game too. Even though he's framed as a villain, he's perfectly fine showing up only to help Mega Man if he absolutely needs it. Outside of that, it's like he's spying on Mega Man and getting entertainment out of it. That said, the first time Proto Man saves his brother is a pretty good moment for his character. Going into this cutscene, Mega Man doesn't want to harm his brother now that he knows how important he is to his creation, even with the lack of a scarf and an off-key whistle proving otherwise. But have no fear, the real Proto Man appears to expose the imposter and give Mega Man a confidence boost, in the form of a one-of-a-kind L-Tank. Even though we rarely see Proto Man fight alongside Mega Man in saving the world, it's always cool to see him helping out on the side, directly or indirectly. Now that we know that Proto Man was being framed all along, it's up to none other than Dr. Wily himself to dump the whole exposition onto you, through 40 seconds of absolute silence. Not only is this reveal empty in sound, but it's lazy in its presentation and has no sauce to it. The whole point of the four Darkmen was so Wily could experiment with the first three and make the fourth one a combination that can believably cloak as Proto Man but Wily only says Dark Man Robot like there's just one of them. Also, Dr. Wily's eyebrow is missing a pixel and I hate it! Ugh! One of Mega Man 5's most popular traits is having an easier difficulty than other Mega Man games, but I actually think it's a good quality to have. In a series known for being rather inaccessible to newcomers in part of its retro design, Mega Man 5 provides newcomers a smooth gateway into the series. And with a new game comes a diverse cast of Robot Masters. Napalm Man is the heavy artillery guy in his design shows. Wave Man is one of the coolest looking water Robot Masters out there. The combo of Star Man and Gravity Man bring forth interesting mechanics that mess with the gameplay. And you wouldn't want to mess with Charge Man with that angry look of his. If there's one problem with the stage select, it's that Mega Man loses the detail of pointing his eyes at the selected mugshot. It's pretty minor, but it does remove the soul that was having him in the center and observing his opponents. The level design is quite strong, generally speaking, and there are stages that carry a good flow even if Mega Man just sticks with the buster, 
For example, Charge Man Stage has many train mets, all in different positions on the upper levels of the train, and because of this, it is quite fun reacting to their presence by shooting and sliding in rhythm. Wily Stage 2 has an underwater section with conveyor belts supported very well by jeeries and spikes, making for a very tense section that feels like a natural increase in difficulty for one of the endgame stages. One of the standout aspects of the level design is that every Robot Master stage has one of eight letters to find. They are pretty easy to collect as none of them require a huge effort, but each provide their own challenges. Some letters can only be obtained in a short time frame, like in Crystal Man's Spike Drop. Others require specific movements, like in Gyro Man Stage, which is probably the toughest letter in the game, but one in particular is actually hidden, taking advantage of Stone Man's hidden room gimmick to emphasize exploration. Once all the letters are collected, you get a great reward in Beat. B is a blue bird who specializes in attacking enemies automatically for you, and his attack power should not be underestimated. He can even destroy the Jiris here. He can also be used in tandem with the regular Buster, and while he isn't necessary to beat the game, thankfully his inclusion should not be passed on. He does damage to bosses too, and some of them are actually weak to beat. So going back to that topic of upgrading existing features, you might be asking if this actually benefited the game in the long run. Unfortunately, you'll be dismayed to learn that instead of a Robot Master weapon, it's the Charge Buster that's OP this time around. Charging at a faster rate and has a massive hitbox, almost the same size as Mega Man himself. Although it still does 3 damage, roughly 78% of enemies have 3 or less HP, and if that's the case, the Charge Buster will penetrate all of them in one shot, even if they have 3 HP. And this is a trait only native to the Charge Buster and no other weapon. Also, in doing 3 damage to bosses and readying up much more quickly than it did in Mega Man 4, makes it way more effective than regular lemons by default. A certified boss killer that's more often than not better than the actual weaknesses. There is a nerf in that Mega Man will lose the charge if he gets hit, which only serves to be frustrating more so than an interesting nerf because mechanically, you're using up time to charge up your buster, thus holding off on damaging an enemy right away, which means getting hit will only make you waste that time that you spent charging up that attack. For some reason, enemies have very noticeable iframes, a trait that was only unique in the Game Boy titles up until this point. I never liked this, because it punishes me for mashing to my heart's content, and it's a mechanic that dissuades you from using anything else other than the charge buster. Water Wave is a weapon whose potential especially gets crushed by this, as you shoot three waves which, theoretically, should deal three hits, but it will only count as one hit to an enemy unless it's running away from the waves, then it might deal two hits. Speaking of weapons, this is one of Mega Man 5's biggest crimes, a weapon set that might possibly be the worst in the entire classic series. In addition to these enemy iframes, the weapons are fundamentally underpowered and inferior to the Charge Buster by statistics alone, as every single weapon has a base damage of 1. Crystal Eye is meant to be a stronger version of Gemini Laser, but ends up feeling more cumbersome by comparison. Gravity Hold is a screen nuke that does its job against weaker enemies, but can't even lift up 2 HP mice with a single attack. Napalm Bomb is one of the stronger weapons, but that hardly matters when the Charge Buster lets you dish out that kind of damage from a safer distance. The only exception to this is Gyro Attack, mainly because more enemies are weak to it. In addition to being criminally soft against enemies, their unique functions are very limited and feel dysfunctional at best. Charge Kick turns the slide into an invincible attack, which is fun to mess around with, but there are many setups with enemies on very short platforms or next to walls that make using it risky. Same with Water Wave, but it also can't be used in the air, upside down, or on moving platforms. There's so many areas where just trying to find places to use this weapon is a challenge in of itself. Gyro Attack's mechanic ends up playing like a worse version of Magnet Missile that forces Mega Man to stop in place if he wants to manually aim, and Star Crash has some strange ammo consumption that favors offensive play over defensive, even though the damage is terrible. Then there's Power Stone, a contender for one of the worst weapons in classic Mega Man history. Three stones spiral around Mega Man, but they are prone to flying right past enemies. Even if they do hit, it universally does one damage against every enemy in the game, 
and is very likely to do only one damage with each attack. The only high health obstacle it can one shot are the rolling drills in Napalm Man stage, but even Water Wave can do that. And worst of all, this weapon actually dings off of enemy fire. Let that sink in. The only consistent way you're getting milliage out of this one is standing still and picking off enemies far away from you. Ain't that exciting. The Charge Buster wasn't the only thing that got upgraded. Rush Coil has a new design with the spring now in his belly. This means that when Mega Man stands on Rush, the dog springs up to allow Mega Man to jump off at a higher altitude. Unfortunately, this new design fails because it does not synergize with the layouts or give you much of a reason to take advantage of this new function. In the end, you'll still be using Rush Coil for its original goal of reaching a very high area, so the new design ends up feeling needlessly obtrusive with having to press the jump button twice just to achieve the same result of one button press in the previous games. When it comes to new utilities, however, we are introduced to the Super Arrow which provides something far more unique than what Balloon and Wire offered in the previous game. Although its attack power leaves much to be desired, where it really shines is allowing Mega Man to stand on it as it speeds by, making for a great speedrunning tool. This is balanced by ammo draining rapidly as you stand on it, and while it does overlap with Rush Jet's function, there is a greater difference between them. Rush Jet is much slower, but Mega Man can steer his ride and shoot while on it. Super Arrow is more of a high-risk, high-reward variation by comparison, and I appreciate that. Going back to the stages, it isn't just the level design that makes them fun to go through, but the stages themselves have interesting set pieces across to make them stand out. I already mentioned Stone Man's hidden rooms with secret goodies, but then we have Star Man stage, whose entire gimmick is low gravity due to being in space. Gyroman starts his stage with an elevator rising you high up as a short cinematic, but then a much slower elevator challenges Mega Man to slip past the ceiling spikes that come down one by one. The most famous one would have to be Gravity Man stage, featuring panels that not only reverse Mega Man's gravity, but most of the enemies around Mega Man too. There's a lot of fun interactions to be had that make up for the stage being among the shortest in the game. My favorite of these would have to go to Wave Man's Marine Bike section. It is an auto-scroller where Mega Man controls a jet ski and must fight off waves of enemies while surfing actual waves, but I also like it because, ironically, it prevents the player from using weapons and the Charge Buster, two of the game's biggest stinkers I touched upon earlier. The enemy combos are pretty good too, with Joe sneak attacking from behind and the Irukan dolphins jumping about in unpredictable paths. The stage's letter is placed brilliantly too, and the only negative I can say about it is that you can't pause the game during this section, which I imagine was a lazy way to prevent weapon access. There are also some enemies that are so standout and memorable thanks to their designs and attacks. The Sumatron Tigers only react to your attacks, but they jump about aggressively and hit hard. If you avoid using the Charge Buster or Beat, they are some of the most dangerous enemies in the game. Dachon is first fought in low gravity, so its laser attack isn't hard to avoid. When you get to the fortress stages, the regular gravity restricts Mega Man into fighting them legitimately. Apache Joes are one of the few enemies who can tank the Charge Buster, a fact made more scary by their quick speed and gunfire easily overwhelming Mega Man if not dealt with quickly. Then there are enemies that feel like they serve zero purpose. There are many types of enemies that hardly pay attention to Mega Man's existence or even try to obscure his path, just strolling along their area and minding their own business. The Bee Bitter Cannons are meant to be ambush enemies, but with how common they are across certain levels, they lose that trait and end up being nuisances, along with the fact that they have 2 HP and not a single weapon one-shots them. Ugh. The weirdest example are the Rounders. There are only two of them in the entire game, and all they do is circle Mega Man without attempting to actually harm him. I know the idea is for them to tank shots, but the only other enemies are the Sue Bales, and they only have 1 HP. It's not like you're fighting a mid-boss or something. Oh, that reminds me. What the heck happened to the mid-bosses in this game? There's only one, and it's not even that great of a fight. October OA surprises you halfway in the marine bike section, but his pattern is so basic, he can be killed before he can finish one cycle. Mega Man 3 and 4 did so well with their mid-bosses, only for 5 to drop the ball in this department. Unfortunately, the levels do have some problems to them, such as the occasional cheap shot. 
Gravity Man stage has several large spike areas that punish you for falling in the wrong spot. Wave Man stage has his bubble puzzle, which is pretty cool, but if you stay on the rightmost big bubble, you'll get punished immediately by spikes hiding on the other side of the screen, with no window to slide off. This also applies to the spike drop in Wily 1. Pick a wrong direction and you'll be killed without a second thought. Crystal Man stage has these crystal droppers that are specifically designed to mess with your expectations and get you killed in the process of adapting to them. Stages can get pretty lazy too, and it more often than not sours a gimmick's potential. Gravity Man stage may have this awesome flipping mechanic, but it's perfectly fine having not one, but two whole rooms of just bee bitters. Not even the Power Muscler can save this section. Starman stage has an asteroid attack, but it only lasts for two whole screens before it's over. The low gravity also works against the challenge of these moving platforms, as most of the time Mega Man will be off screen ignoring everything. Napalm Man stage, despite being one of the best in the game, has this narrow hallway of rolling drills, and all you have to do is gun them down. The fact that you can stand on them too adds insult to injury with how mindless this section is. When it comes to valuable goodies, there are some mishaps too. Starting with Mega Man 4, 1-Ups have had a cap of 9 and cannot exceed more than that. But interestingly, Mega Man 5's enemies have a much higher drop rate of 1-Ups than any other game. So much so, that it isn't uncommon to reach this cap 2-3 to three stages in the game. It's a shame because having a cap of 99 would have given a bigger incentive to collect all these 1-Ups and see how many you can rack up before the game ends. E-Tanks also have a problem in that they are poorly guarded across the stages. It isn't so much a problem for the 8 Robot Master stages because there are only 3 E-Tanks to collect, and Eddie, who is still cheesable, only shows up 3 times in the game, all of which are also in those E-Tank stages too. By this point, it looks like we're getting a fair ratio of 1-Ups over E-Tanks this time around. But come across the Fortress stages, E-Tanks are pretty much a jump away from being a freebie, and the number you get here dwarfs the number of 1-Ups. Mega Man 5 even introduces a new type of tank, called M-Tanks, which not only fill up health, but also every bit of weapon energy. Despite this, they are way too common across the game for how strong they are, with 6 total M-Tanks, meaning 6 opportunities to restore yourself to full power. Two of them are even in the Robot Master stages for no reason. The game tries to be sneaky about this, by not letting you hold more than one. And if you have an M-Tank, but then come across another one, it'll be gone. Unless you use it beforehand, then you'll realize the Wily stages have M-Tanks that are as easily accessible and common as regular E-Tanks. M-Tanks do have an extra function though, where if you use one, even though you have full energy across the board, every enemy gets turned into a 1-Up, and this even affects certain gimmicks too. This is another reason why a 1-Up cap of 99 would have benefited this game more. Yes, this is a cool easter egg, but why bother when the game stops counting 1-Ups early on, especially by the time you get your first M-Tank? Graphically, this is where the NES games go fully out of their way to look as beautiful as they can, and Mega Man 5's visuals are strong enough to allow each stage to tell their own visual story. Stone Man stage has this mountain range that gets closer in view as you ascend until you reach the clouds. Crystal Man stage has this huge variety of animated colors that blend together so well, going from light blue of the sky, to dark blue, to pink and back. And Charge Man stage has you boarding a giant train from the station, and once it gets on the move it even makes jittery sounds that shake the screen slightly. Lastly, Napalm Man stage has very diverse locations all in one. You start out in a sunset jungle, then go inside the waterfall caves, climb out of the jungle, and make your way into the military base with tanks at the ready. Compared to other games, Mega Man 5's soundtrack has a bigger focus on calm and easygoing tunes as you go through some of the stages, which makes sense given this is an easier game. Stone Man's theme, Gyro Man's theme, and especially Wave Man's theme are very chill tunes that I've grown to appreciate. That doesn't mean the soundtrack is only limited to that, because there are more traditionally fast-paced tunes like Napalm Man's theme and Dark Man's theme, and my favorite would go to Charge Man's theme. There's even some jazz and dissonance mixed into songs like Gravity Man's theme and Star Man's theme, and it keeps the soundtrack quite varied across the game. Even the boss theme has a different approach to it than the ones of previous games. One subtle thing to rip on Mega Man 5 for is how it reuses quite a bit from Mega Man 4, but I'm here to make the case that Mega Man 5 actually improves on these gimmicks. 
The water rushing section in Napalm Man's stage has Apache Joes mixed in with Sue Bales, making for a much stronger enemy combo than the 2 HP enemies just kind of plopping in your way. Wily One brings back the Pistons of Dust Man stage, and with them having a faster speed and more opportunities to crush the player, it seems like the devs actually put more effort into this idea. The entire Met themed aspect is even brought back in Wily 2, but to a much smaller degree. Rightfully so in allowing more enemies to shine. Oh, I should mention the end game is actually pretty good. One of the better ones in the NES Mega Man games, and I'd attribute that to the Dark Man stages. Stage 1 has some of the more complex Yoku block patterns out there. Stage 2 has a treacherous conveyor belt section that allows Star Crash to truly shine. And Stage 3 brings forth the snake block sections that add urgency to enemy combat. Stage 4 is on the shorter side, but it dabbles with the crumbling tower as a nice set piece before the boss. All in all, they have a pretty good flow and are still keeping things fresh with their challenges. Now it's time to talk about the main bosses and oh boy, Mega Man 5 set on the whole is bland and exploitable, so much that it might equate to one of the weaker sets in the series with how little thought was put into them overall. Four of the eight bosses can be cheesed just by standing close to them, stopping them from using their best attacks. This means Stone Man and Crystal Man will be restricted to only jumping, while Star Man and Napalm Man get stuck in repetitive movements. The next three of these bosses actually try to use stage gimmicks to their advantage, but it comes off as shallow. Wave Man's main attack is more likely to hit himself than Mega Man. Gyro Man hiding in the clouds won't matter if he's not going to do any tricks with it, and all Gravity Man does with his flipping is shoot out of his buster, and even that is patternized. The only exception to these traits is Charge Man, but he spends most of the fight being invincible and that comes off more as annoying than as a true challenge. But don't worry, it gets worse thanks to more inconceivable boss design in the form of the Dark Men, having some of the worst fights in the entire NES series. Dark Man 1 is always moving, but when he gets fast, it becomes really awkward jumping over him consistently because of how wide he is. It's like jumping over a leaf shield that stops moving halfway during your jump. Dark Man 2 has the most galaxy brain pattern of all time. How can you not love someone who spends the entire fight walking? Dark Man 3 even has the same close range cheese as the others, only this will stop him from moving, ever. Darkman 4 tries to be interesting by combining the abilities of the previous three, but his attacks aren't very complex and he spends most of the fight without a shield thanks to that huge jump of his. This is not to say all boss fights in the game are terrible, as some of the other fortress fights pick up the slack. Big Pets and Sir Kring Q9 have hard to reach weak points that are protected by bizarre moving attacks, and each have unconventional platforms that reward risky play. Wily Machine 5 has the most amount of attacks we've seen so far from his type, but his gimmick of moving towards you with each hit adds a risk to being trigger happy. There's also the Wily Press and Capsule, but these are too simple compared to the larger bosses above. Not bad, but not really worth talking about. Unfortunately, the game's ending is short and lackluster. Mega Man rescues Dr. Light after Dr. Wily gives him up, and thankfully he's strong enough to hold up the ceiling from collapsing onto him. But what happens after really just repeats the trend of Proto Man's previous appearance, only helping Mega Man if he absolutely needs to. So of course Wily gets away while Mega Man was busy, and Proto Man quietly despawns back to his recliner chair to continue spying on Mega Man for his entertainment, like nothing ever happened. So in the end, I have 18 pros and 20 cons. Really, Mega Man 5 sets out to do what it wants to do and provide an easy game, but that should not be confused with the strange backwards logic it has throughout. The weapons, overall boss design, slip-ups in the stages, enemy iframes, etc. Regardless, the whole point of being easy can be a huge appeal to newcomers, and easy games aren't exempt from being fantastic games. Just be wary that Mega Man 5 is not one of them. So with that, I'm going to give Mega Man 5 a rating of 5 out of 10. Okay. And that's the end of this video. If you like what you saw, consider giving a like and subscribe to my channel. As per usual, I have my Discord server Demontropoland in the description, so consider joining if you like my content. I also want to say that with the roadmap of the first five games complete, 
I can finally start doing my research on Final Fantasy for the NES. I will say, however, that since this is a much bigger scale game, work for this review will be on the side as it'll take much longer to complete. Hopefully it should be done by the end of the year, but that's just my estimation though. And with that said, I'll be signing off. Take care, folks.